What are you in business for? What is it that you're trying to achieve? Today we're joined by Steve Forbes, publisher of the magazine that bears his name, and a member of the Heritage Board of Trustees. He's also the author of a new book, Freedom Manifesto. Thanks for being with us. Good to be with you, Rob. Thank you. I want to begin on the book. You acknowledge that uh, the free market has uh, received a bad rap, um, uncaring, greedy. Why is that, and how do we go about changing that perception? It's because uh, commerce is always looked down upon. It's not seen as something that is open, creative, and one of the things we try to do in this book is show that government does not occupy, and we emphasize big government, not uh, the government imagined by uh, James Madison, envisioned by James Madison, but uh, big government control. But government, even though it's grossly inefficient, we all know the raps against big government, but it always gets bigger because it always occupies the high moral ground. Uh, they come up with a program to help kids. What do you have against children or the elderly? You, you're against helping the elderly? So uh, conservatives are always thrown on defense. And what this book does is put, uh, turn the tables and says so the free markets are caring. Free markets are moral because they meet the needs and wants of other people. It is government that is selfish, government that is short-sighted. Government is the here and now, where free markets look to the future. Uh, governments create conflict, 1% versus 99%, young versus elderly, management versus labor, on and on and on. Conflict is how they exist. Whereas in free markets, you're trying to smooth things, make cooperation possible. Uh, you may not love your neighbor, but you sure want to sell to your neighbor. So uh, the book tries to uh, say everything government, big government postures itself as, free markets actually deliver if they're allowed to. You wrote this book before the November election, and at the time you said that Americans had a choice between freedom and limited government and a European-style welfare state. So where do you see things now that President Obama has been reelected? I think what it underscores is, the, everyone beats up on poor Governor Romney, but hey, uh, this was a missed opportunity. He never did what Reagan did uh, over 30 years ago when Reagan ran. Yes, he wrapped Jimmy Carter for his miserable record, but he always led with positive ways of how we're going to turn this country around, starting with massive tax cuts across the board. Uh, Romney, uh, at the convention, his acceptance speech, his five points, almost came as an afterthought at the end, a footnote. And so if you don't lead with that, if you don't have a positive alternative, if you do what the Republicans did and allow the other side to define you for three months, $200 million of trash ads, and you are radio silent, uh, they define you, you're going to lose. You're obviously somebody who did run on a big idea when you, when you ran for president, um, the flat tax. Well, how do you view that debate right now? Is that kind of big tax reform possible in Washington? Are you hopeful that it, sometime in the future we might actually be able to achieve something like that? We're going to have to sadly have a new president. Uh, this president could do it. There is a consensus. You saw a Simpson-Bowles commission. Democrats signed on at least to the idea of taking some of the stuff out of the tax code and reducing tax rates across the board. So a consensus is emerging. But unfortunately, the, the president's version of a tax reform is Darth Vader's version. That is, raise rates, take out deductions and exemptions, and raise rates. It's sort of the Darth Vader version of the flat tax. What did you make? Line two, send it in. And finally, I want to I shift now to, to the work you do at the magazine. Uh, Forbes has been a place where you've really adapted and innovated as the digital marketplace has expanded. And other media companies have struggled uh, to make that type of transition. You just launched a, a new iPad app, for instance, this week. How do you view technology, and, and what is the future of publishing you see it as digital media becomes more ingrained into all the things that we do? And one of the things you have to remind yourself in an environment like this is what Peter Drucker said. You have to remind yourself, what are you in business for? What is it that you're trying to achieve? So you don't get hung up on the models of how you did things in the past. So in terms of content creation, once upon a time you just had a staff or a, a handful of freelance writers and uh, would create content that way. Now today we have almost a thousand signed contracts with contributors. Uh, in the old days, five years ago, uh, the magazine would print 12, 1300 articles a year. Uh, now we're doing 120,000 a year. We virtually publish a magazine every uh, day or two. So uh, content creation has uh, changed. What an editor does has changed. So we do some of the old, but we also very much into the new. Steve Forbes, thanks for joining us. Thank you. For the Heritage Foundation, I'm Rob Bluey.